uh, investors are feeling a little defensive, a little into safe havens. It's been the third straight week of a negative performance. The S&P starting to weigh on investors, showing up in the flows here. IVV in the inflows, that is a good sign, obviously. But look at XLP. This is never this high. This is the Staples ETF, right? And it looked 760 million is a lot. But look at the year it's having. That would be a record if it ended now. So a lot of money into Staples despite the market's performance. But again, most of the market's performance was the first three months of the year. Last six months, market's barely up. And look, we've got our two poster children of the year, we're mine, Go, a GOVT for fixed income, that's the whole curve at once, that's been on a tear this year for fixed income, and USMV on the equity side, that's minimum of all. That's how people want their equities this year is a little less edge. Let's look at the outflows, and this case gets stronger. It's a who's who of trading crowd favorites risk on ETFs here. A uh, little mini bloodbath, actually. So SPY, the Qs, IWM, JNK, I mean, everybody's on there. VU is the outlier. VU seeing 2.7 billion in outflows is highly unusual. I don't think this is mom and pop running for the hills. I think it's a model trade. We'll see. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, speaking of that, let's look at traders and allocators. That chart, I love the show to see what's going on. Now, good news is allocators are hanging tough. They are still putting in money despite the VU outflows. The traders, though, are spooked. And you can tell it's one of the worst weeks for outflows from those ETFs. So, Scarlett, I think this is one of those cases where uh, defense has become the place where the best performing ETFs are. So performance chasing and defense are count, not, uh, one and the same this year. Yeah, and of course it's showing up in momentum as well. All right, let's bring in Sam Husko. He's founder of SGH Wealth Management and Vildana Heyrich. She is a cross-asset reporter for Bloomberg News. Sam, let me start with you. Eric just gave us his take. I'm curious to get a sense of what you're seeing. Any themes, uh, distinct themes that are showing up in the market as the fourth quarter gets underway? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the low volatility factor has been getting all these flows over the course of the year. And, you know, the big question with that is, you know, are these performance chasers? Are they going to come in and out like momentum, which we are seeing a bleed between the momentum factor and the low volatility factor today? And so, you know, with that, you got to dive in. And I would say on a short-term basis, this could potentially be an anomaly. But on a long-term basis, I think there is good reasons to continue with a low vol factor. And one good thing to distinguish here as well, too, is the difference between low volatility and minimum volatility. Uh, you know, the sector constraints is, is the bigger thing within that. And when you look into the low volatility sectors, uh, utilities are at a 24% overweight over the last rebalance. And then also uh, real estate is at a 16% overweight as well, too. And so, uh, you know, with that, they've had really good years because interest rates went down yeah. almost a little unexpectedly. So within that, that probably won't persist. Uh, but within the long-term trends, there's really good reasons to still st be in low volatility. And Vildana, you have some numbers to share with us when it comes to vol low vol, the money moving into these low vol funds. Right. These two products, USMV, SPLV, are among the most popular low vol products. And both are on pace to see record inflows for the year. USMV alone has taken in about $12 billion so far this year. So let's talk, uh, you, you read your top five ETFs here, and two of them are min, minimum, uh, sorry, mid-cap low vol and small-cap low vol, which Correct. is interesting. Are, is that, how are you using those? Is that your full mid-cap and small-cap exposure for your clients? Because this is the one of the critiques, is you're going to be, in the Invesco brand, you're going to be a little overweighted with some of those sectors, although a lower PE. So uh -huh. just talk a little bit about... Uh, how you use those in a portfolio. Yeah, uh, well, first off, it is our 100% exposure to those. So we are willing to be active managers. Uh, we believe, you know, MinVol, uh, those same metrics I was saying before, 24% in utilities, 16% in real estate, MinVol only has about 5% and 2%. So they're much closer to the index. And so we believe, you know, there's going to be small elements of active management that can be, you know, returned out of that, but nothing major. And so, you know, that said, uh, what we want to look at is how to, to kind of seize that. And the low vol on the long term, it's about dispersion of performance. So in an uptick, you know, in the best performing months in the market, dispersion is fairly tight. So the best performing stock and worst performing stock are fairly close. Mm. So when this thing underperforms, there's a lower price to underperformance because we're going to do pretty close to what the markets do. But in that downturn, dispersion gets really wide. And so in those moments, this has, in the worst performing months in the market, uh, this outperforms 86% of the time in those worth performing months. So, you know, with that, it goes down about 60% of what the markets go down by. So really, you make your money in that downturn, right. even though the markets might recover at a smaller pace. Well, Don, I want to turn to you because another big theme that's come up of late, of course, is Brexit. There's been lots of talk, but no action and therefore no clarity. How is this showing up in ETF trading? 
Right, and it's a bit counterintuitive because there is so much happening Brexit-wise and we have the UK economy slowing. But if we take a look at a fund like EWU, it's been seeing inflows over the last couple of days. And then if we take a look at BlackRock's FTSE 100 fund, which is listed in London, it's also been seeing inflows. It had its best month ever in September. And a lot of people might be looking to short, but at the same time, we do have investors who are betting that the fallout from Brexit won't be as bad as a lot of people are expecting. Of course, you got to balance that. And of course, within the asset management industry, you also have the, the fee wars, the race to zero. Yeah, and Sam, I got to ask you this. We talked earlier, you're a Schwab client. Correct. Schwab went to zero. They caused everybody to go to zero except for Fidelity. Uh, but more, you, you're starting to hear more rumblings. These other um, platforms are upset that because Schwab won't give you much in your cash sweeps, 0.12%, and that's how they make their money and they yep. feel like it's kind of misleading. Sure. You're a client. What do you think of that in terms of that sweep uh, yield mm -hmm. you get, which is pretty low as you can see here compared to the other ones? Yeah. I mean, what, what I think about that is if I was keeping a lot of my clients money in cash, I'd be getting a lot of phone calls. So, you know, they're, they're not giving me their assets to sit in a cash money market. And then, you know, as we discussed earlier too, you can still buy a money market that's outside of their sweep. So I don't really see it as an issue. You know, what I, what I do see in Fidelity's approach to this at least, and that's I think the biggest news item out of this is, you know, they didn't make as much of their money off of, you know, other vehicles. And right. so they, they have to kind of keep their profit margins to where they are, which they are very profitable, private company. Uh, but then also they make a ton of money on 401ks. So we got to understand where their bread is buttered. Those don't have transactional fees. And so it's a different model altogether.